about 40 to 50 percent higher. So this is uh, about 40 ish years later. And the thirst for oil is about a thousand barrels a second. Now, this quote is not mine, it's from these guys here, but I subscribe to it. Our generation will be defined by how we live up to the energy challenge. So, before I, got, I tell you about my research in energy, which is not going to change the world, but you know, so we're trying to generate new ideas and thought processes, I want to introduce really what is the energy challenge to make sure that we're all on the same page here. So, the purpose of this lecture is to promote awareness. I, Actually don't have a silver bullet to solve this challenge. I don't think anybody does, and nobody is likely to have that kind of silver bullet, silver bullet for a while. So there's no one-size-fits-all solution. There's no credible replacement technology for fossil fuels. This is today's reality. Okay. Um, and demand for fossil fuels is increasing. We see that supply is definitely not increasing. And so the first thing we need to do is save energy because that requires some time until we develop potential replacement technologies. The problem though is that the price of oil is correlated with everything we do. When we want to extract or process raw materials or food or real estate, anything somehow relates to the price of oil. Extracting raw materials costs energy and our energy is fossil fuels. So even if we did have a replacement technology, we would require a lot of investment in energy to extract, extract the raw materials and move to that new uh, technology paradigm. It's not just, you know, okay, let's do it. There's going to be a significant investment in energy which is required for that. Of course, there are consequences on the environment. Uh, I won't really dwell too much on that here because, well, we're kind of aware of it and in any case that would require another lecture in and of, of itself. And then one of the issues that is a bit delicate, of course, because it's uh, political more than scientific, but it's the angle of sustainability versus population increase. We'll see what that means. So, um, this is the uh, Human Development Index as a function of annual per capita use of uh, power, kilowatt hours. And uh, so you see here uh, the countries that have close to one, the highest human development index, uh, well, they're the usual suspects. Canada is up here, US, Australia, Japan, etc. What this tells you is that when you want to go from 0.9 in incremental steps towards one, you need a significantly higher energy or power consumption. And this is a kind of threshold value here. This is where you jump sort of across this value from what we call usually developing countries to developed countries. So energy, of course, again, is correlated with, with any type of goods required for to produce any kind of service or goods. And, and so it takes energy to improve people's standard of living. This, I guess, is very obvious. Now, what are the consequences of the type of energy we're using? Well, I mentioned consequences on the uh, environment. So there's global warming, which is attributed to fossil fuels, and acidification, uh, meaning you know acid rains and whatnot, desertification, habitat loss, and so on. And of course, this also has uh, consequences on uh, on health. So typically, quality of life uh, is not really correlated with energy consumption once a country is industrialized or developed. Okay, so that means that once you're developed, uh, you can burn a lot more energy, so to speak, but it doesn't really change your quality of life. <clears throat> so this also gives you a little bit of perspective. Uh, this, of course, is a collection of pictures patched together, uh, taken from satellites and whatnot. And again, you can see the areas that are mostly inhabited around the world. You can see that south of the equator, there might be less population, but aside from that, there's also much less energy that is made available to uh, populations in all these developing countries. Can anyone guess what this uh, almost straight line is up here? That's an island river in Egypt, yes. So you can guess that most of the population resides uh, around the island. So, as I mentioned, quality of life correlates 
uh, with energy consumption during basic development, but it's almost completely uncorrelated uh, once countries are industrialized. So when you reach this sort of threshold value of 2.6 tons of oil equivalents per year, there's no real improvement in quality of life as measured in terms of, say, the Human Development Index. And uh, if you take the nation with the highest number of over overweight or obese people, it's the United States, 130 million or 64% of the population, it's also the one with the highest energy consumption per capita. So uh, someone from the United States consumes as much energy as two Europeans, 10 Chinese, 20 Indians, and 30 Africans. This may be good kind of <laughs> relative proportion of what, uh, of what it's like, right? Um, and then it can be argued that over a definite threshold, uh, additional energy increases inefficiency of personal life. So obesity is one, social life, traffic jams, more waste, uh, higher medical expenses, and greater inequalities between people. So this is a brief uh, history of individual energy consumption from primitive man, uh, the hunter-gatherers, and then uh, again, uh, primitive forms of agriculture and, and then farming, developed farming, industrialized man, and this is uh, technological man. And you see here, uh, each one of us consumes about 100 times more energy as the uh, people in the, in the Stone Age. Um, and this is a critical perspective in terms of, of this pretty large ratio of, I mean, do we really have a better quality of life than people in the Stone Ages? In many ways we do. Uh, life expectancy is much longer and we can fly and we can do all sorts of things that they weren't able to do. But the, the you know, quality of life doesn't necessarily relate to, to some of these parameters, right? And look at what we're doing to the planet or to the environment. And whatnot. So let's look at equivalent energy. Um, now, if you want to, uh, say, run a TV set uh, with muscular work, then you need two people uh, running on a bicycle continuously. And if you want to run uh, uh, an energy-efficient washing machine, then you need 15 people. Uh, if you call these people energy slaves, you want to be politically incorrect, call them energy slaves, then if you want them to develop enough muscular energy to uh, have a uh, fully loaded Boeing 747 takeoff, then you need 1.6 million of these energy slaves. Okay? Uh, and this is a typical home, so that's about 5 kilowatts here, and this is a, a Class A truck, which typically carries oil or gas or diesel or something, and that's 45 megawatts. Now, in the last decade or so, there have been more and more cover pages of The Economist that were dedicated to energy in one form or another. Some of them were about the end of the oil age. Other, other ones were about the clean energy myth, the end of cheap food, uh, growing fuel, and whatnot. And this is a quote that I got from my dad. So he says, his dad rode a camel, he drives a car, my son lets me ride in jet planes, and my son will ride in jet planes. Right. Yeah. And in fact, the question is whether this here will be uh, <laughs> okay. And this is uh, the amount of oil that was burned uh, in 2007. So now it's actually more than that. I don't know exactly how much, but you know, it's a cubic mile. So it was it, now it's probably 10, 20 percent, maybe 30 percent higher. It doesn't really matter. It's huge. Um, and here comes. The, the great conundrum. So, you look here, this is, uh, this is again from 2007, but this graph is still pretty accurate. And you see that uh, non-renewable fossil fuels are the most widely used fuel of modern society. Uh, this is oil, this is coal, this is gas, and everything else is small. Maybe uh, fossil fuels altogether is still about 75% of the pot, so it's completely disproportionate. And here we go. Uh, population. So, world population has been constant for thousands and thousands of years. Until this period here, which we refer to historically to as the um, Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. Now, what is it that made the Industrial Revolution possible? 
the energy. Yeah, but what form of energy? Coal. Coal. That's the first fossil fuel that humanity started using on a large scale. And that's what prompted the Industrial Revolution. It could be argued that anything that happened since then, uh, the whole era we can refer to as the Energy Revolution. And you see what happened since then? Population has been increasing exponentially. Now, we are trying to feed exponential growth. This is a mathematical concept. We're trying to feed exponential growth on finite resources because we know that fossil fuels are finite. We know that they're not infinite. And intrinsically, from a mathematical point of view, it's clear that trying to feed exponential growth on finite quantities is not sustainable. Now let me translate that into a sort of more ominous but perhaps clearer concept that nobody likes to hear, but nevertheless. So we're at 7 billion something here. The world population before fossil fuels was about half a billion. If we don't find a replacement for fossil fuels, we essentially have to go back to the world population before fossil fuels. Not exactly, because we do have, you know, part of the energy pie which is independent of fossil fuels, and it's not going to happen overnight, that's for sure. But in the long term, that's what we're facing. Okay? And, you know, as much as we can call this the energy revolution, maybe 20, 30 years ahead, historians will look at the wars in, say, Iraq and whatnot and the whole Middle Eastern region as the energy wars. I wouldn't be surprised. Now, here we have the history of oil discovery, and this is oil consumption. You see that uh, we are roughly here. Okay, so now we consume a lot more oil than what we discover. That's not surprising. Again, we know that oil exists in a finite quantity. There's no way to escape that. Um, this is what happened in Norway. Uh, you know, Norway today is a rich country, but a few decades ago it was one of the poorest countries in country the earth. It's the oil that made them rich. They, they became so rich, they don't even want to be part of the European Union. They figure, why bother, you know, let's keep these people at bay. We're, we're richer, we don't need them. My wife is Norwegian. <laughs> uh, so, you see that they reached a peak in oil production, and now it's dwindling. Now, there was an American geologist, his name was Hubbard, and he predicted this concept of Hubbard Peak. So, what he did is he uh, analyzed statistically uh, the oil production of oil fields across the United States. This was in the 50s, and he said, look, you know what, based on these statistical analyses, oil fields reach a certain peak production, and then it goes down. And based on that, he actually predicted that at some point there would be an oil crisis because, you know, obviously supply would go down while demand was going up. This was in the 50s. People laughed at him. He had predicted that this, uh, this kind of crisis was likely to occur in the U.S. in the early 70s. But what do you know that the first oil crisis was in 1973? We know that the Hubbard peak will occur on a worldwide scale. We just don't know when because the country is that export most of their oil don't tell us how much reserves they have. So it's impossible to predict exactly, right? But as we're seeing that oil prices have been going up steadily in the last, say, decade or so, uh, well, you know, we, it's difficult to imagine. Is it nearby? Is it in a decade or 50 years? It's difficult. But it's going to come at some point. And of course, you know, as production uh, saturates and demand keeps going up, because population is increasing, then of course price will also go up. And this has already been happening. Now from a geopolitical point of view, there is the other problem that about two-thirds of the world reserves are located in this region here. So obviously, <laughs> we can try to be friends and everything, but they hold the rest of the planet uh, pretty much uh, in, their, in the palm of their hands because everywhere else, uh, there's really peanuts. So this is a, a kind of breakdown of what we're looking at. Uh, some people argue we could do more nuclear. Uh, nuclear poses a few problems. One of them is that, again, um, nuclear fuels are a finite resource. So in any case, that would be a sort of temporary solution. We don't have 
that much uranium to go ahead forever. And then there's also the question of safety and uh, the era that is sort of considered a terrorist uh, era. And then there's also this quote from the Economist March 1986, four weeks before the Chernobyl uh, disaster, the nuclear power, the power industry remains as safe as a chocolate factory. Yeah, right, big time. Um, so nuclear may be a short term kind of aid, but not a long term solution. Uh, there's several other candidates that we can look at. Uh, we don't want just alternative energies, we want something that is sustainable for the long term. But what does it really mean for a type of energy to be sustainable? That's the key question here. This is a paper from about a century ago. This was an Italian chemist who published in Science the Photochemistry of the Future, and he pointed out the need for an energy transition from fossils to renewables. So he was way ahead of his time. Imagine 100 years ago. This was pretty incredible in retrospect. These are uh, some forms of what is considered renewable energy. Hydroelectric power, this though has um, environmental consequences, so in terms of sustainability, it's borderline. Uh, solar energy, yeah, in the long term, uh, you can imagine that the sun is going to outlive humanity on this planet. So for the long, long term, if we really learn to harness the, the power that comes from the sun, that could be the solution we're looking for. Uh, basically, you know, it, one hour of sunlight, if we were able to, you know, to collect it over a large enough area, that could power the world for, for like a year, basically, if, uh, if we could collect it efficiently. But we're not very good at doing that. Uh, there's wind power, there's tidal power, there's several other potential candidates. Uh, what you notice here, though, is that in each of these cases, you require a lot of raw materials and developing infrastructure. And remember, when you do that, it costs energy. Okay? That's one of the key problems. You want to go, say, say that it was economically viable to build solar, then you would have to, to basically build solar plants like this all over the world. And imagine how much energy it would cost in terms of extracting all the raw material, building, etc., etc. And then the maintenance. Solar panels, they don't last forever. After a certain number of years, you have to replace them, and so on. There is no easy solution to this. And one other concept that um, we all need to be aware of is this here, energy return on energy investment. Um, now, in the good days of oil, you would drill a new oil field, and you would invest one barrel of oil by drilling, and you would re retrieve 200 barrels. So your return on energy investment was huge. 200 against one, wow, that's amazing. That's one of the reasons why the oil economy developed so fast and became so pervasive. I mean, that return on investment is huge, right? And another reason, of course, is that fossil fuels have this amazing energy density. And this is another reason why, from a technological standpoint, they're really difficult to replace. Now, some genius a few years ago said, hey, we can extract ethanol from coal, from corn. Right, so the energy return on energy investment is you invest one and you get 1.3. Really? Really? That's a genius idea? Uh, somebody else said ethanol from sugar cane, 1 to 8. Yeah, that's barely acceptable. In Alberta, we have the tar sands, which means, you know, sands that are dense with tar. So you can extract oil from them. And the return is two to three. Now, today that the price of oil is so high, or in the last decade or so, it has become economically viable to extract oil from the Alberta tar sands. 20 years ago, we were really considered a, a very good economic model. But on top of that, there's the consequences on the environment. I mean, if you're growing sugar cane as they do in Brazil, or corn as they do elsewhere, uh, so that you can transform it into a liquid fuel. Well, that area that is devoted to growing that crop for fuel is not going to be usable for food. So, you know, you have to make a choice there. Do we want energy or do we want food at some point? <laughs> that, that's, at some point a few years ago, the price of, of pasta was going up and Italians seemed to be desperate at some point because, of course, everybody was trying to grow corn to transform it into fuel and so, Suddenly, it was, you know, in terms of uh, uh, demand and supply, it drove up the cost of weed and making pasta and so on and so on. So, uh, there is this 
key issue that there's no one size fits all solution. Uh, the first thing we need to do is energy saving, and that might buy us some time. Uh, one way to do that is to develop new infrastructure that helps to save energy, and we'll see what that means. Um, remember that uh, fossil fuels, particularly liquid fuels, are, have this amazing energy density. They're the only ones that have sufficient energy density to fly a plane. You can't really fly, I mean, there's been some studies showing that you can fly small planes on solar for short distances, but you can't really fly a, one of those huge jumbo jets on solar uh, or, or other types of energy, right? So, I mean, that's, that energy density is so amazing and so difficult to replace. And this goes back to the uh, world population challenge uh, and how, of course, besides the consequences on energy, it has consequences uh, on the environment. So every day there's 200,000 new people on the planet. That means 70 million every year, and that means about 1 billion every you know, 15 years or so. Uh, it's uh, predicted that by 2045 it would be roughly 9 billion. And this is a, an interesting parallel. So there was an experiment on St. Paul Island off the coast of Alaska. Somebody introduced reindeer in 1910. And uh, their energy was the grassland. And of course, there were no predators. So they uh, essentially multiplied, reached a peak, and then they overgrazed, and then they were extinct. And this is what happened on Easter Island. So their energy was the palm trees. And uh, they, they have, of course, they didn't have any predators either. So the increase in population, you see that here the increase in population is roughly exponential until they reach the peak. And then at some point they had cut off all their palm trees. Does anybody know why the palm trees were their energy? <coughs> they made rafts to go fishing. And once you don't have palm trees anymore, there are no more rafts, no more fishing. And at some point they became cannibals. So that there's an ancient insult on Easter Island which says, your mother's flesh hangs between my teeth. <laughs> Pretty colorful. <laughs> and this is us. This is world population. You see this exponential growth here. The question is, what's going to happen next? Are we going to keep growing forever? Not likely. Are we going to saturate or are we going to drop? Our energy, of course, is fossil fuels, and we know that <coughs> it's not going to be eternal. So the question is, what is going to happen to us next? And mind you, the choice is entirely ours. So, what can we do from a scientific point of view? Because the world population angle is a political aspect of it, and I'm not going to touch it. Okay? It's not my responsibility as a scientist or even as a person to get into that. But I want everybody to be aware, right? Remember also what I said before, that one American uses, you know, as much energy as 30 Africans, and I think it was 10 Chinese or something, but of course, the Chinese are growing in population, and they're using more and more energy because they want to catch up in terms of human development index with our uh, uh, standard of living in rich countries, right? Um, so, this again is an interesting quote from uh, Chami Chang. Our black and nervous civilization based on coal shall be followed by a quieter civilization based on the use of solar energy that will not be harmful uh, to progress and to, to progress into human happiness. There's an if right there at the beginning of all. Okay, so what can we do uh, from a scientific point of view? So I work in this area that is called nano and that several of you are also working in. And for the, those of you who are less familiar, this is typical dimensions in nature. This is an ant, 5 millimeters. Uh, hair is about 15 microns, and then mites, red blood cells. You go smaller and smaller until you reach the dimension of single atoms. And the holy grail here is uh, materials by design. So imagine your atoms are like Lego building blocks, and the idea is to place them in a in an architecture so that the building blocks will interact with each other and will have specific functionalities. This is the holy grail. In some cases, we've been very successful. In other cases, we have absolutely no idea what we're doing. And so there's still a lot to do uh, in this uh, research space. And let's see, I think I need to use the cursor here. We also learned uh, to image and visualize uh, 
uh, the atomic scale, the molecular scale, the fusion uh, in, uh, uh, in various systems like these surfaces here where we have molecules that are diffusing on the surface and we can track their diffusive motion and extract all sorts of interesting parameters about, uh, about their properties uh, and so on. So we have reached a certain level of understanding. Now we're trying to <coughs> transform that understanding into some practical applications. And that's always the tricky part. So this is a, an overview of my research program. Uh, you see that we work on a variety of different topics. That's one of the problems with the Canadian funding system. You end up being extremely scattered all over the place. But let's say that you take this, uh, this little new graph here. Uh, and this tells you a lot because we like to look at size effects at the nanoscale. We know that elements and materials, when they're very small, they often behave different. For example, gold, considered the most noble of all metals, well, at the nanoscale, gold nanocrystals have interesting chemical properties, they're catalytic. And also, uh, you shrink these materials to very small dimensions, they gold would go from metallic to semiconducting properties. And this here is the Lycurgus cup. It's a Roman artifact from the 4th century AD. It's a held hostage at the British Museum in London. And you see here that it contains gold and silver nanoparticles embedded in the glass matrix. And because of this, it appears uh, either green or red in transmitted and reflected light. And that's because bulk gold appears to be yellow, but when you shrink gold to the nanoscale, uh, there's a shift in the plasma resonance frequency. Essentially, this changes all the optical properties, so the power of nanogold appears to be red rather than yellow. Now, the guiding principle for us is to understand the role of surfaces and interfaces in materials functionalities. So we look at these very small systems and we study in particular uh, surfaces and interfaces and uh, see how we can determine structure and optimize functions in materials. So, looking at the role of morphology and compositions and harnessing this knowledge in process. So there's various examples of classes of materials we work in, but essentially today we'll focus a little bit on these multifunctional materials specific to energy applications. Uh, now these are, this is a brief history of lighting, and uh, you see here from the old days of oil and you know, fire type lighting, gas, kerosene and so on, and then the incandescence filament, I guess you know, some of you might still have a home or at least you remember light bulbs with the incandescence filaments. And then suddenly we are now in the era of solid state lighting using these semiconducting devices. And it turns out that, um, so one key element to remember is saving electric energy. You can save a lot of energy if you use these solid state lighting devices. Uh, essentially, when you look at LED traffic lights, each one of them will save about $1,200 worth of electricity per year. It's pretty significant. And also, uh, they reduce CO2 emissions as opposed to more ancient technologies like the incandescence lamp. So, you also save a lot of CO2 emissions just by switching to these uh, LEDs. And uh, so, here is one uh, system that we've been working on. Uh, so, this is a, a case of an organic film Made, made of molecules called HPV anthracene. And uh, so this is a, uh, what is called a line emitting transistor. So it's a device that has the functions of the transistor, but it is also line emitting. So it's uh, not just something that you can use as an electronic device, but also, uh, for example, in a display setting. Okay, and so again, it's relevant for energy saving. And what we found is that this particular material has a very high uh, charge mobility, which is crucial for the functioning of the device, but also a very high total luminescence uh, quantum yield in the crystalline state. And so this is a very promising material uh, for uh, all these types of applications, particularly because it is organic, and therefore it's fairly cheap, it's solution processable, and so on. So this is a, one of the key issues, you know, if you look at solid state lighting, usually it's inorganic semiconductor technologies, which have a lot of advantages, but they're also extremely expensive in terms of you know, how to build a, a big factory and, and clean rooms and so on and so forth. These organic materials also have issues, of course, but they tend to be much cheaper uh, and, and easier to implement from a technological point of view. Now, the 
key challenge for uh, these systems in organic electronics is what happens here at this interface. So in the transistor you have your gate and your gate dielectric, and then you have source and drain electrodes, which are used to inject or collect current, and depending on the type of device you're looking at, this is your organic film. And the type of interface that forms here between your organic film and your electrodes as well as the gate dielectric, that plays a huge role in uh, optimizing the device properties. And so what we are trying to do uh, alongside <coughs> many others uh, on the planet is develop new approaches to study this specific interface because that will, will provide key insights on how to improve the device performance. What we ideally we would love to do is manage to image this interface with the same level of detail that we can get from other systems. This is a, a case of a fairly complex molecule that forms these two motifs on graphite. So in this case, we can really pinpoint molecular structure with an incredible level of detail using a scanning tunnel microscope. But this type of interface here is, uh, proves to be pretty elusive for this kind of technique. So that's uh, one of the key challenges of my head. I mentioned uh, infrastructure. So this is a modern building, and that's great. But if you think about older buildings, well, older buildings were erect mostly on the assumption that energy for heating and cooling was cheap, right? I mean, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, energy was cheap. So you could, in Australia, I guess you would turn on your air conditioning. In Canada, you would turn on your heater. But either way, it was fairly cheap. Today, it's not that cheap anymore. And so, you know, the, the kind of materials you use for your building, that makes a huge difference in terms of energy saving, because if you use materials that have very good uh, insulation, then that's going to really save a lot of, uh, a lot of energy. And so you see here, this is a, a new construction nanomaterial, an aerogel, uh, that has very efficient insulation. You see here, there's a, a flame from a Bunsen burner underneath, and you can actually put your hand on it without uh, burning your fingers. So this is a type of key advance that you need uh, for uh, today's and tomorrow's infrastructure and buildings so that this can help us save energy. So energy saving relates, of course, to illumination, using solid state lighting as opposed to other uh, older and less efficient and more polluting technologies, as well as uh, key infrastructure materials of the future. Now, uh, another uh, uh, phenomenon that a lot of people are not aware of is this one here of gas flaring. So again, this is uh, the world at night from a satellite. And okay, the yellow parts, of course, are lighting. But what about these red parts all over? What is that? It's gas flaring. What is gas flaring? When you have oil fields that are in remote locations, or you have, you're extracting natural gas in remote locations and whatnot, well, there is going to be a lot of natural gas, and some of it is high grade and some of it is not. And if it's a remote location, it might not be economically convenient to actually ship it, whether it's through gas ducts or by other means, to place where it can actually be used. So very often, uh, the companies that are extracting, <coughs> they just burn it. And that's gas flare. So they're wasting a lot of <coughs> fuel, and they're polluting. It's not very good. But hey, it's economically better for them, so why criticize them, right? I mean, their goal is to make money, isn't it? Now, the question is, what can we do about it from a scientific point of view? So, in principle, we can try to design new catalyst nanoparticles that would allow to transform that natural gas into a liquid fuel, which would be easier to transport to a location where it can be used. Okay, so this is one of my areas of research. Uh, we have been trying to design nanomaterials with optimized catalytic activity, for example, for methane and methanol conversion. Uh, the progress we made so far actually doesn't relate to this. It's a completely different story that I can tell you another time. But essentially, we did create nanocrystal uh, bimetallic catalysts or hollow nanoparticles or alloys. And we found that um, we can very much improve the, the catalytic uh, hydrolysis of ammonia boring, which uh, is an important molecule for hydrogen storage. So it's kind of a um, parallel track to what we were originally planning, but nevertheless interesting for hydrogen storage, you know? We'll see what that means later on. And of course, 
I mentioned the energy of the sun. So this is the solar spectrum. And uh, if you want to capture the solar spectrum, typically you need a semiconductor, which means uh, a material that is not a good conductor usually has a band gap between uh, the, the sort of valence band and the conduction band. And so in that uh, gap, uh, you don't have any uh, electronic states available. And that determines how much solar energy you can actually capture and then convert into uh, charges that are then collected from electrodes and then that's your power ultimately. And um, so what we've been doing is we've uh, been working on so-called uh, third generation solar cells. These are called dye-sensitized solar cells. They're photoelectrochemical cells that somehow mimic the photosynthesis reaction in plants. Uh, so that's a key issue here. Uh, there's you know, 30, 40 years of history of these cells. The major breakthrough was, was made in about 1991 by Michael Bretzel from EPFL, and there's been a lot of progress since. And of course, we're looking again from our material scientist angle of trying to uh, introduce new materials, new soft material that may lead to some improvements. Uh, this work here, actually, we did in collaboration uh, with an Australian group, so that's Colin Raston. Uh, from UWA and just moved to Flinders in Adelaide. So my great sorrow now, instead of visiting him in Perth, I'll have to visit him in Adelaide. But hey, such is life. I've never been to Adelaide, I'm here being unkind. I'll, I'll tell you in a couple of weeks after I've been there. Um, anyway, so the idea here was to use dye atoms. What are dye atoms? Uh, these are highly successful, successful photosynthetic organisms that live in water environments. And they're responsible for 20% production of organic compounds from CO2, and they make up about a quarter of all plant life and weight. So they're pretty important. Most people don't know about them, but they're there and they're important. And um, uh, they're made by these 3D porous uh, uh, silica exoskeletons, exoskeletons called frustules uh, that, can be, that have pores 50 nanometers and microns. And essentially, these frustules are specifically designed by nature for light scattering and trapping. So putting them into a solar cell might actually help because it will, in principle, help to collect more photons, right? So that was the idea. And in fact, uh, you see here uh, the basic photoelectrochemical cell. This, these are the properties. The key parameter here is the efficiency, 3.5%. Uh, and if you use only diatoms, it won't work very well. But if you use several cycles of uh, coating diatoms with titanium, which is a material, semiconductor material that is using these cells, you actually reach uh, significantly higher efficiency than 3.5. Now, granted, these are not record values that you will find in red cell flat. So what we're showing here is a new concept that you know, with a lot of technological development and improvement could actually make a difference one day, but uh, even the cells of all the are, are not apt for commercialization yet. So this is all basic research that it might find its way into the market one day, but it's really about new ideas and how they will develop into see technologies in the future. This is another concept, again, related to VSSCs. Uh, one of the key issues that you've seen is the relatively low efficiency of solar energy conversion, and the other key uh, challenge for VSSCs is stability. They're not very stable. And so what we did here is we used this material here, which is very well known because of its mechanical and electrical properties. These are carbon nanotubes. And we introduced them into the geometry of the VSSC. So this is what the final material looks like. You have essentially carbon nanotubes, titanium dioxide nanoparticles, and dye molecules. And you see here what happens in terms of the current voltage characteristics. So um, the basic cell, this is day one, and after six days of almost continuous operation, the performance drops significantly. But if you introduce carbon nanotubes, well, the performance hardly changes after the same period of time. Okay, and in these types of cells, we actually achieve efficiencies of up to 9%, which again, it's not a record, Retzel claims 15%, that's the world record for these cells, but 9% for this type of cell, considering we didn't really spend a lot of time optimizing parameters and whatnot, it's actually pretty good. 
So here we're looking at two different concepts on how to address uh, some key challenges in this third generation solar cell technology. A lot of people would argue against this and say, you know what, silicon now nowadays is very cheap, so why are you bothering with this? It's always hard to say because until the technology actually makes it into the market, you know, there's so many factors that come into play <coughs> and of course economics, supply, demand, availability and so on. That's a major one. There's other technologies. I mean, one, one of the key advantages of BSSCs is actually that um, they're much cheaper. So uh, basically the return on investment is much faster than for silicon. The problem is that because of stability issues, they might not last more than two or three years. And you don't want to change your panels every two or three years, that would be a pain, right? But on the other hand, the entry to market in terms of, of how expensive it is initially is, is actually the, one of the key aspects here. So I mentioned hydrogen. How many of you have read The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne? Not many, huh? And so good. Some down there. Well, if you have read it, you might remember this quote. I believe that water will one day be employed as fuel, hydrogen and oxygen, which constituted you sing are together will furnish an inexhaustible and inexhaustible source of heat and light, while an intensity of which coal is not capable. Water will be the coal of the future. Jules Verne had predicted a lot of things that happened in the next century. I don't know how he did it, but it's pretty amazing that way. And today we can actually use hydrogen. Uh, to power the hydrogen car, and there's even uh, hydrogen fuel cell bus, and so on. That's pretty cool because, you know what? When you transform, you know, the energy from hydrogen into, you know, electricity, for example, uh, your byproduct is water. So it's a fantastic, clean reaction. It's great. The problem is, where do you get the hydrogen in the first place? That's the problem. Because what people, most people don't know is that hydrogen right now is extracted from methane, which is again a fossil fuel. And you might say, why not extract it from water? Well, in a typical reaction of water splitting, it costs more energy to extract hydrogen from water than what you get when you actually burn the hydrogen afterwards. That's the key aspect that a lot of people are not familiar with. So, uh, in terms of, again, a solar power, one uh, key area of research is solar water splitting, so using the energy from solar radiation, which is free, in quotes, nothing is for free, but let's call it free because it comes from the sun, and technically we don't have to pay for it itself. Um, and so solar water splitting means trying to capture solar <coughs> radiation, use it to split water into oxygen and hydrogen, and that leads to this clean fuel, which is hydrogen. And what we did in this series of studies here, so we uh, essentially drew these nanowires made of BFO. This is a multi-ferroid material. It means it has two ferroid properties. It's ferroelectric and magnetic at the same time. And it's a semiconductor. And so being a semiconductor, it can be used for water splitting. But we found that if we decorate it with these gold nanoparticles, actually uh, you have an enhanced water splitting mechanism so that you're producing 30 times more oxygen and therefore more hydrogen than the parent BFO wires. So the BFO nanowires are made with a very simple chemical reaction called hydrothermal synthesis. It's quick and easy to do. And the gold nanoparticles are done by are made by ablating a gold target in water. So they're fairly clean, and you then you immobilize them by surface chemistry on the BFO nanowires. It's a very simple mechanism, and you get this composite material that has uh, very interesting properties. And our understanding is that this is a size effect. Remember what I mentioned to you, gold behaves differently at the nanoscale. So you have these gold nanoparticles that have enhanced plasmonic properties. So there is an enhancement of the electric field locally, which helps to split uh, the water molecules, uh, as well as uh, gold acting as an electron trapping center because of this specific geometry and interface. Now, in terms of materials developments, if I look, say, 10 years into the future, uh, one of the key challenges when you synthesize a material and therefore try to determine its properties and functionalities is that we know the initial points, the initial starting point of the reaction, and we know the final bits, what comes out. We know very little of what happens in between. 
But what happens in between carries all of these insights, the important information about controlling the final morphology, structure, and properties of your product, your end product. So the key to this is having an instrument that allows you to take snapshots or ideally movies of what's happening between the initial and the final state. So last year we got about $15 million from the Canadian government for this time-resolved TEM. So this essentially is a TEM, an electron microscope, that has a very high temporal resolution so that you can actually look at processes on relevant time scales. So in one type of process, you're looking at uh, 10 nanoseconds time resolution, and in another type class of phenomena, you're looking at picoseconds and angstrom and stroboscopic mode. So, and, and we also have energy resolution where you're looking at quasi-particle excitations and whatnot. So this is going to be a key instrument that hopefully will lead to completely new insights about how materials can be synthesized, processed, and transformed, and how we can control morphology versus functionalities. Now, the title of the lecture is Energy Crisis. Uh, I guess in uh, Western culture, as company, we attribute a negative connotation to the word crisis. But crisis really uh, comes from ancient Greek, and the word means a bifurcation of paths, or if you like, a choice. Do I go right or left? Right? It's uh, kind of interesting that this here is the internet tells me, it's the word crisis in Chinese. It's a composite character. This part means danger, and this part means opportunity. So again, it's a choice, a bifurcation of paths. Which way do we want to go? Do we want to go the safe way or the dangerous way? It's really up to us. Okay, I owe a debt of gratitude to a number of funding agencies that support us uh, from the province of Quebec and the federal government of Canada. And I think this slide is probably not up to date, but more or less, uh, you see all the people that uh, are either working with me or have worked with me. Uh, students and postdocs are the folks underlined in blue, and these are the guys that do all the work and deserve all the credit. And uh, so a tribute to them for 